Hello friends, this is Reverend David from Christian Path Ministries of Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Christian Path. I hope you're well, and that today's message, Physical and Spiritual Hunger, will open our eyes as to the poverty and hunger that's going on, not just all over the world in these third world countries that we see, but in America too. And it's not just going on in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense as well. We've all seen the commercials for the physical poverty. They show these pathetic little children, basically flesh-covered skeletons, living in little mud shacks with no food, no clean water, medication, all these diseases, they're dying. And you know, they're always in these third world countries somewhere. They never mention the people in America. What about the homeless people in America, the ones that are starving to death, the ones that are living in shelters, or they're living in a cardboard box over a steam grating in the middle of winter? It never mentions them, does it? It only goes on to mention the third world countries, probably because they're the most extreme cases. You look at some of these kids and your heart goes out. You almost want to cry when you see them. And of course, the narrator or the person announcing all of this is telling you all about their misery and their hunger and their diseases and their deaths, all of these things to move you emotionally, to get your heart moved. And then comes the hit. Send us this amount of money, or send us that amount of money, and this amount will feed a child over there for a week, or this amount will buy medicine, or a new shirt, or this one will get them some education. But you know what? If you think about it, if you make the donation, your heart's in the right place, you feel sad, you feel bad for these people, you want to help because they desperately need it, how do you know that the money you're sending to this organization or charity is really making any kind of a difference. What I'm saying is how much of the money that you're sending is actually going for the cause. Out of every dollar, how much of that is buying food or giving fresh water or medicine or making a difference in the life of one of these poor children in a third world country? You don't know. The last time I checked, I don't know if this is still right as far as percentage-wise, but as long as 5% of the actual donation goes toward the cause, then that charity or organization is legal and, quote, legitimate. So every dollar that you send them, one nickel, goes to the cause. Well, where's the other 95 cents? Who's seeing that? I mean, of course, there are administrative costs. We know that. That's realistic. Even to pay for the commercial that you saw, someone had to pay for that. So there are administrative costs. There are people on payroll, stuff like that. But if you look at some of the high-ranking executives of some of these charities, they have a lifestyle that anybody would envy. Lavish. Limousines. Mansions. They have money out the wazoo. They eat in the finest restaurants. They're very wealthy. Well, where is all their wealth coming from? The other 95 cents on the dollar? Now, I'm not saying that every charity does this. I'm not condemning charities at all. But some do, some don't. And when you see these different things, how do you know which charity is actually making a difference in these little kids that you see in third world countries and which charities are lining their own pockets. There's really no way of knowing because some are actually helping and their heart's in the right place, although they do have administrative costs. Others are just out to line their bank accounts and they could care less about anybody but themselves. But think about this. Why are people so desperately poor? Not just in third world countries, in the U.S. too. Bad decisions, making bad mistakes. Yeah, sometimes. But there are other situations that people have no control over. Look at the economy. The housing market. People lose their jobs. They lose their homes. They have families. They don't even know how to feed them. They have nowhere to live. If they're lucky, they can go to a shelter. And that can be dangerous too. But they wind up homeless if they don't have relatives to go to or another alternative. And these people you don't really see around too much. They're not advertising themselves, but they are in poverty, physically in poverty. They're hungry. They're desperate. What about them? 
And what should we do as Christians? Should we just turn our heads and forget they exist? If someone walked up to you on the street, which has happened to me already in the past, and they look really hungry, they're dirty. You can tell they're street people just by looking at them. They are desperate for food. They ask you for a dollar. What do you do? Do you just keep on walking and pretend you don't hear them and you're embarrassed by them even approaching you? And you just say, oh, man, this guy, ooh, get him away from me. He looks dirty and he probably has bugs. Do you think that way as a Christian? No. You look at him and you try to size up, is this guy for real? Is he legitimate? Because there are some of these people, there was one girl in particular I heard of in Philly, she would be on the street with a sign that says, we'll work for food. She looked dirty and she looked hungry. But you know what? She eventually got found out. She had a, a Cadillac parked around the corner. Th this girl made like 85 grand a year doing this. But you know what? Most of the people you see that are in that situation are true. They really are homeless. They're hungry. They're desperate. Now, if they're holding a sign that says, we'll work for food, you're not going to hand a stranger the key to your house and say, here's my address. I got a few errands to run. Go ahead to my house and work on it, and I'll meet you there. Let's be realistic here. You wouldn't do that. But what you can do is say to them, are you seriously hungry? Do you want a meal? If they say, yes, this is all they want. They're hungry. There's got to be an eatery not too far because there wasn't. There was a place about two blocks away. You say, meet me up there. I'll buy you something to eat. So when that person shows up, you go in the diner a restaurant or cafe or whatever it is. Whatever they want, let them eat. And then pay for their meal. If you can, give them 20, 30 bucks and say, here, this is for your next meal. And when they say, oh, thank you, what do you say? You're welcome. No, you don't. You say, you know what? Don't thank me. When you're alone, thank the Lord. Thank Lord Jesus because he put me in the situation where I can help you this way, even though it's not a permanent fix for you. I'm doing the best I can. And he is the one who led me into your path so I could do this. So don't thank me. Thank the Lord. Now, you'll probably get a very surprised look from this person. But it could be and probably is true that this person is not just physically hungry and starved and in poverty. They're also spiritually hungry too. This will open their mind. They see Christianity in practice. They have a full stomach now and 20 or 30 bucks in their pocket because a Christian helped them. It wasn't just lip service. They needed help and they got help. Now let's have a look here at Luke 3.11, when John the Baptist was asked by his followers what they should do. What did he say? He said, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. Now let's have a look at Proverbs 14.31, where it says, he who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. Now, if we flip to Proverbs 21, 13, it says, Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. So what do those scriptures tell us? That if we turn our heads and ignore the poor, what are we doing? We're actually reproaching the Lord. In fact, Proverbs 14, 31 is saying that if we do this, we are reproaching the Lord. Now, think about this. We have pity, compassion on the physically poor and hungry. Of course, we see them. And why? Because we can actually see them. We see the misery they're going through. What about those people who are spiritually poor and hungry? Those who have never had the gospel preached to them? Or those who aren't saved? Or those who have gone to mainstream churches, regardless of what denomination it is, and it got to a point where they were not being spiritually fed at all, they would go every week and they get nothing from it. They're not getting any biblical nourishment. They're not getting any spiritual food. So they stop going. What about them? Now, the physically poor, they're starving and they suffer. They can have illness, disease. We know they have misery and their bodies can die from all that. But the spiritually poor, all right, they're going to die one day physically too. But what happens to their spirits? Their spirits are eternal. 
We can have pity and compassion and mercy on the physically poor, whose misery eventually will end when they physically die, but what about the spiritually poor and hungry, whose misery could last for eternity when they become spirits? Shouldn't we consider them? They're hungering in spirit, and the long-term effects are even worse for them than for the physically hungry. Think about it. Now, as long as there have been people, there have been poor. As long as there have been humans on this planet, there have been rich people and poor people. And didn't Jesus say in Matthew 26, 11, the poor you will have with you always? Now, we automatically assume by that that the Lord Jesus was talking on the physical level, which he was. He was talking about physically poor people, but he was also talking about the spiritually poor too. Those who don't know him, who have never been preached the gospel, the people who don't know Lord Jesus, who are spiritually starving for the bread of life that comes from the scriptures, God's word. Now, how does physical poverty relate to spiritual poverty? Let's think about it. Being physically hungry or spiritually hungry, and as Christians, what can we do to help both? We can help physically hungry. We can send to one of these foundations or charities, like we said, or we can work one-on-one to find people locally right here where we live and help them in some way so we can see who we help and we know we're actually helping someone. We know that 100% of the money we're giving is going to buy the food or to help this person. But what about spiritually? What can we do there? Now, if we have a look at Isaiah 58, 10 and 11, it says, If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and a spring of water of whose waters do not fail. Now, what does all that mean? What is that scripture saying here? That we need to extend ourselves to the physically hungry, sure, and show Christianity, but the spiritually hungry also have to be fed. They have an afflicted soul. We can extend ourselves, and we have to extend ourselves as Christians to the physically and spiritually hungry people. I'm sure you've heard the expression, actions speak louder than words. It goes way back. What does it mean? It's a popular expression. I heard of that even when I was a kid. It's been around for probably decades or hundreds of years. But what does it really mean? Actions speak louder than words. As Christians, if we preach the word, or we tell the poor afflicted souls about the Lord, how much the Lord Jesus loves us, we're preaching the word, we're giving them spiritual food, that's great. And how important it is to serve the Lord, to walk in his footsteps with faith, grace, mercy. But if we do nothing to physically demonstrate the love of the Lord or the mercy, isn't it just lip service? If a person hears our preaching but doesn't see us doing a thing, doesn't see us extending ourselves one little bit to put Christianity into effect by showing the love and mercy of the Lord, how much credibility does our preaching even have on the people we're preaching to? What I'm saying here is physically help the poor, the needy, the hungry, okay? People see this. Fill their physical stomachs. Relieve some of their physical misery. Give them renewed hope in mankind and especially renewed hope in the Lord when they find out that the Lord is within us, the Holy Spirit's within us. Don't you think that's going to be a lot more persuasive to get them to even think about the Lord than just giving them lip lip service and saying, well, yeah, I know you're hungry. Well, gee, sorry to hear about that and uh, I hope things get better for you. Come on, what did you do for the person? They will see the Christianity that we preach actually in practice and it will hit home because they're seeing it actions speak louder than words when you see a person who's having a lot of physical misery because of their hunger their poverty their situation and we do something to relieve that by giving ourselves showing them 
the love, mercy, and grace of Lord Jesus, it will become a reality to them, not just lip service or some crazy preacher that they think is trying to save their soul when they haven't eaten in two days. It will mean a world of difference to them. When we preach to them, they'll not only be being fed physically, but spiritually as well. What I'm saying is, it's not just lip service. We're not just telling them about Lord Jesus. They actually see and feel his love and light and mercy and compassion within us in a physical way. And it will be so real to them, more real than anything they've ever experienced. Very, very real. And also, others that aren't even involved, say bystanders, when they see what's going on, don't you think it's going to make them think? Don't you think it'll affect them in a positive way too? When they see what you're doing, they, they'll, they'll be like staring at you in awe because they, it, they feel it's so incredible that something like this is going on because they've never actually seen it. They are personally witnessing the love of Lord Jesus in practice now, aren't they? Don't get me wrong here. Verbal preaching is important. The Bible is important. That is where we get our spiritual food from. That's where we get our nourishment, our spiritual nourishment. But unless the reality of what being a Christian means is really seen and realized by people, not only the person or, or people that we're helping, but others that witness it, people that are standing by watching, they'll pretty much be spectators, but it'll hit them like a ton of bricks. They'll think, wow, when they see Christianity in real practice, they'll personal, personally witness the love and mercy of Lord Jesus through our speech and our actions, and it will get them thinking about the Lord. So by doing this, we're doing a lot more than we think. When you say something or you do something, you have no idea who overhears you or who sees you doing it. So you are just doing this to be a, to be serving the Lord, to be showing this person that you are of the Lord, that you have the Holy Spirit, that you are reaching out to them. The Lord is reaching out to them through you. And others that happen to be standing around or overhearing or they see it, they are also going to be touched, not just the person that you're trying to help. The real light of the Lord is shining through you as a Christian when you're doing this. And again, it's not just lip service because we've all heard that. You can go anywhere and you'll hear that. You can go to the beach, you can go on the boardwalk, you can go any place. And there are these screaming preachers that are just screaming, save your soul, the Lord is real, all these other things. What do people do? They walk right past them, they don't even pay attention to them. And why is that? They consider it lip service. They look and they figure, oh, it's just some radical preacher, some holy roller. They don't take any of that seriously. They don't take the guy seriously. They don't take what he's saying seriously. But you know what? If you go about it this way, you're not just shouting out on the rooftops. You're actually physically showing the love of the Lord. It's coming through you to physically help someone. And people will realize, hey, this isn't just lip service. What is this guy all about? What's going on? What is he doing? This is for real. So as Christians, what should we do? First, we have to realize that there are poor, starving people, not all over the world, but in our own country too, in the U.S. And it's always going to be that way. There's always going to be poor people. The Lord Jesus said that, and we know why. It could be for a lot of reasons, and one reason could be, too, is the Lord wants us to see that there are physically starving people, hungry people, people in poverty on a physical level, but relate that to the spiritual one, too, which is even more important because we're talking about our eternity, our spirits in God's kingdom. So we have to relate the two as being one. Not only are we showing in a physical sense, the love of our Lord, but we're also showing in the spiritual sense that eternity is what we're really looking at. 
and people are starving not only physically, which they always were and probably always will be as long as we're here, but they're also starving spiritually. So as Christians, working directly for the Lord, the Holy Spirit is within us. It will work within us to witness. And don't forget, too, although we're helping and we're reaching out, we also have to be fed ourselves, too. We have to eat too, don't we? And I don't mean in the physical sense. I mean in the spiritual one. We have to be physically fed and we have to be spiritually fed. We need bread too. We we have to eat. We have to be nourished. So we know how to do that. We know where to get our nourishment from. We get it directly from the Bible, from the scriptures, from the Lord. The Holy Spirit empowers us. This is where we get our nourishment. So we have extra food in the spiritual sense. So we want to share that spiritual food with others who need it. And there are so many who do. Not just physical food, but spiritual food too. The Lord provides us with it so we can share it with others who need it. We have to know that we need to reach out to them in the name of Lord Jesus. When we ease at some of their physical miseries, we can't just sit back and say, Oh, look at that. Isn't that a shame? What can we do about it? We have to work to feed the people who are starving, both physically and spiritually, in the name of Lord Jesus. Let them know that we're not the ones feeding them. The Lord is feeding them. We're just vehicles that he's using. He is the one feeding them, both physically and he's going to feed them spiritually through our words. Remember, actions speak louder than words. And we as Christians not only have to preach the gospel and feed the hungry and help the poor physically, but in spirit too. We're talking about eternity The lost souls will come to Jesus and know that their eternity will be in God's kingdom, where they're never going to hunger for anything again. But again, as Christians, it's up to us to reach out to the people that need us. Now, have a look here at Psalms 41, 1 through 3, where it says, Blessed is he who considers the poor, and the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. And you will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. So what's the what's being said there? That we consider the poor, both in physical form and in spirit, the poor and the hungry, and we are working to feed them in both senses, physically and spiritually. And when we do this, we're considering them, not just worried about ourselves all the time, our own problems, physical problems, mental problems, emotional problems, spiritual. We have to reach out to others because we are blessed, and we are then showing the power and the mercy and compassion of the Lord by reaching out to these people. And part of our agenda as Christians is helping others. We are nothing but a physical vehicle for the Holy Spirit. Remember that. We're showing the Holy Spirit. We're showing the love and compassion and mercy of the Lord and what it means to get into God's kingdom. And a lot of times, these people can't look past their physical problems. They can't look past their misery. Think about it. They cannot really think much further than they're starving, they're hungry, they have no place to live, they have no clothes to wear, they don't know what to do. They are not thinking anything beyond their immediate physical needs, which is fine. It's understandable when you're in that kind of situation. That's where we come in. By helping them with these physical needs, guess what? It directly connects and opens a door to spiritually being fed too, because now They're being eased. They're being taken care of. They're having food put in front of them. They're being preached to at the same time where you're saying the Lord is the one who did this for you. I'm just here. I'm just a representative. Thank the Lord. Don't thank me. Don't you think it's going to have an immense impact on this person? We know we have to reach out to others. Actions speak louder than words. I can't say that enough times because there are so many 
preachers out there. There are so many Christians who proclaim to be Christians that don't do anything to help anyone, and their their first concern is themselves, and they don't really care. They don't want to get involved with helping anyone else. So remember, feeding others physically, spiritually, and feeding ourselves through the Bible directly and through the Lord and the Holy Spirit. The Bible is our bread spiritually. We have to keep the Bible close at our sides. We have to repent of our sins if we haven't done it already. Be baptized. And I don't mean being baptized to any specific religion or denomination. Just being baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Like Peter says in Acts 2, 38 and 39. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord God will call. Now once you repent, you're baptized, you accept the Lord as your Savior. Don't think that your life is going to be any easier. Just the opposite, because we know we're in the end times. And to be a Christian, to follow in the Lord's footsteps, is going to be very dangerous. We're going to be persecuted, laughed at, ignored. And you know what? As we get closer to the end time, with the rise of the beast, the mark of the beast will become mandatory. What do we do when we don't accept that mark? We will be attacked. Some of us will even be killed. But you know what? Don't be afraid because we're not alone. We have the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible and we have each other. And if you need me for anything, don't hesitate to contact me. All my information is right on my website. It's www.mychristianpath.net. It's mychristianpath.net. And keep your Bible close by, read your scriptures every day, because remember, that is our bread of life. That is our nourishment. So we have to feed ourselves with the Bible and then reach out so we can show others the mercy of the Lord. Make the Lord your first priority. Let others know that we are of the Lord. We serve him to please him. We'll be willing to die for him just as he died for us. And keep your Bible open Keep the scriptures in your mind. Keep the, the kingdom of God in your mind at all times. And if you see someone who needs help, or they're hungry, even physically or spiritually, don't keep walking. Don't turn your back. Remember, that's what we're here for. We have to feed ourselves through the Bible and feed others physically and spiritually to bring them to the Lord so that we can all wind up in the kingdom. So keep your faith strong, keep your prayer lines open, and remember, pray that you will not be deceived, pray for others, and one day we will get into God's kingdom. Until next time, I'm Reverend David. Goodbye, friends.